Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, I tell you what, we're in a series, and and really all of that, that that's there, maybe you're new and you're looking for what is my next step uh, to Victory Life Church without maybe giving a commitment. The next step, I would say this, is if you haven't done so already, is to download the Victory Life app. And the reason that's important is this will help you um, know what's going on, events you can be a part of and sign up for through the app. But one of the things right on that app is what we call the growth track. That's what these people have gone through. And it just tells you how to sign up or tells you about that growth track and how to be a part of it. But more than anything, it answers this question for everybody, whether you're new or not. What is my next step? If you've never been baptized, it'll tell you the next step is to be baptized. Uh, join a life group. It's all there through the app. And, uh, and it's really because of your faithfulness and your generosity in, in bringing the tithe that all this discipleship is even possible. Your giving has allowed us to reach 17 people that have now discovered where God has called them to be a part of and to grow. So thank you so much. Can we just give God a bunch of hand clap and praise? He is making a difference through you. That's the message I wanna communicate today. So, hey, we're in this series called I Believe, where we're taking a look at the Apostles' Creed, not the Apollo Creed that came out later on, but the Apostles' Creed and the Nisan Creed. So the Apostles' Creed is a little shorter version. That's what we did with the intro. I like to uh, preach from and talk from in this series on the Nicene Creed. It goes in a little more in depth. But, but here was the purpose of the Creed. The Creeds came out, both of these, the Apostle Creed, the Nisan Creed, about 321 AD. The church is new. This is the first gathering to represent all the believers because as things are growing, they're spreading out. The Bible the illiteracy is really high. They're, they're really counting on word of mouth testimonies and a few letters circulating around. And so because people that have become Christians don't really know what they believe, they're starting to hear the narrative of culture that is speaking into their belief systems. And if culture has a voice and our, what we believe evolves, then, then we have this changing element where truth no longer holds its power as truth. And so they taught them this creed to memorize so that if anything foreign or anything that wasn't true was presented by culture, they would go, wait a minute, that's not what I believe. This is what I believe. Now today, we don't worship the creed. The creed isn't scripture. Scripture it is the word of God, the heart of God. And today we have Bibles literally on our shelves. I probably have about eight, 10, 12 different Bibles on my shelf. I love to buy Bibles, collect Bibles, give Bibles away. Almost everybody here, if not all, has the Bible right on their phone. So it's still important today in the church for the believers in the church to understand what is it that I believe. Maybe you're on a spiritual journey and you want to know what is it that you believe. And so these creeds, just to reinforce what we believe, but they're meant to direct us now to the truths that are outlined in the Word of God. Does this make sense? Can I get an amen? All right. So we don't worship the creed. It just reflects what the truths hold. This is what we believe. But here's where I want to encourage you to put yourself in the Word of God and to put yourself in there daily to know what you believe. Have you ever noticed that how you reference somebody or how you reference determines the relationship? And, and, that, and we're looking at the relationship that believers have with the Trinity. God the Father was last week. We're going to look at God the Son today. And then in the future weeks, we're going to look at God the Holy Spirit. All three are God, one God, a triune God, but one God. And so have you, the way, have you ever noticed that the way people refer to you you can instantly tell where that relationship is at. For instance, if I hear anybody, uh, I had somebody just call the, the office uh, last week, and they said, is Jim there? Now, if I hear Jim, we're talking high school. Nobody's called me Jim since high school, and ain't nobody calling me Jim today, okay? So, but if I hear Jim, I go, oh, the way you're referring to me, the way you see me, I know exactly where that relationship is from. It's from high school. If I hear the word, if, if somebody goes groucho, 
then I know that's college age. In college, everybody called me Groucho. And so uh, if somebody references that, I go, oh, that's somebody that knew me from college. And so now, you know, people call me James or Pastor James or Stud Muffin. I know it's Eileen. I know it's Eileen. So right there, she's the only one that calls me Stud Muffin. I'm like, yeah, that's Eileen. So the name, the title, the what we see usually defines the relationship, doesn't it? And so as we take a look, this one part of the creed is, I think, one of the most important parts of the creed because it, it, it asks the question, who is Jesus? Everybody has an opinion and an answer to what they believe who Jesus is. If you don't have an opinion, that's a belief. But we all have a belief, and, and how you answer that question, who is Jesus, will determine who you are the rest of your life. That's how powerful that question is. How you answer this question will determine what kind of husband or wife you are. It will determine what kind of parent you become. It will determine what kind of student you are. It will determine what kind of worker you are. Who he is defines our lives. And here's the exciting thing. In 19 minutes and 51 seconds, you'll actually get an opportunity to answer that question for you personally, who is Jesus? And when you come to that conclusion, it defines, transforms, and sets the course of your life. So let's take a look at and look at who is Jesus? Well, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed really declares who is God the Father, who is Jesus, the, uh, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And so who Jesus is, the world has so many different views of it, and the way you define it will really determine just a little bit of variation really makes a whole new picture, such as the Jews. If you ask the Jews, who is Jesus? They will use the term, he is a failed Messiah, meaning this. He had a good message, he did some good things, but at the very end, he failed as being the Messiah. If you look at Muslims, the Quran actually has a very similar view of who Jesus is, but just a little bit different of a belief changes everything. In the Quran, a Muslim would say that Jesus is a type of a Messiah, so there's some deity assigned to him. He was a type of a prophet born of a virgin birth, but fathered by an angel rather than God the Father. That small thing changes everything, doesn't it? Um, it would say they believe Jesus was not crucified nor died on the cross, but miraculously saved as God. So it's not enough to believe that Jesus is a deity, a God. It's to believe, what else do you believe about him? That he's a begotten son, that he is Lord, that he is Christ. All these things come into who he is and what we believe makes all the difference. And, and here's the Nissan Creed. In fact, what we'll do is, as I decided, uh, I decided first service, I said, we're going to say this together. But, but here's the amazing thing. As we say this first part together, we're only going to do the first part, to realize that these words echoed the rooms of the early church. These words were spoken in homes as new believers gathered. Over the centuries, these words echoed in cathedrals. And to this day, thousands and thousands of churches, different denominations, this doesn't belong to one denomination, but different denominations still recite this creed. And so as we say this, just know that we're part of the body of Christ, the, the universal church, the big C church, in declaring what we believe. Let's see if we can say this together. It says, I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal, begotten for the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. I believe in the begotten, not made of one, being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. 
for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. All right, we're going to end right there. There's more to the creed, but this week it looks at what I believe. I love how the first word starts, I believe. In fact, we're going to take a look at that first portion where it says, I believe in one Lord. And uh, go ahead and click that next part up. And it says, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son, eternal begotten for the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. I love how it begins with, I believe, or we believe. It doesn't say, we think, because there's a difference between what we think and what we believe, isn't there? One's done with the head, one's done with the heart. I believe. What you believe will determine the course of your life, and every one of us here believes in something. And as I said, to believe in nothing is to believe in something. Belief is what drives us. Back in 2015, 21 Egyptian Christians were marched down to the shores and executed, beheaded one by one by ISIS terrorists because of their belief and their faith in Christ. And each one before a sword was put to the back of their necks were given the opportunity to denounce their faith, but if they declared what they believed, that it was this creed met instant execution. That is a belief that is down deep. A thought doesn't drive the human spirit to that point. And I often think what the last two or three in that line of 21, what they were thinking, but I know they were stronger than ever in their conviction to declare, I believe that Jesus is Lord. He is the Christ. He is the begotten Son. It seems so extreme, but what we're all called to, whether we face that declaration on a beach or whether we walk into tomorrow, our our belief, our conviction, our heart needs to be as as resolute to, to walk with him. And so what is it that we believe? Well, let's just take a look at this and why it is so important. Because I think it also will help many that might be stuck on their journey. Because in the first part of that creed, it it gives Jesus this title, and, and it says, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Christ is in his name. Christ is a title, Christo, Messiah, the only Son of God, eternal begotten. It has to be begotten because many people were starting to say that God created Jesus where he was begotten, he was born, which means he was the seed of the Father, which is deity, which makes him God. It's important that, you, that we believe he wasn't begotten or, cre- or that he wasn't created, but he was of the seed of the Father. He was deity. He was God through the Father. And eternal begotten. So we see three titles, and I want to work these backwards in reverse order because they've impacted my life at different stages. And it's first called, he's first, or in that order, he's called begotten son. Why is this important? Why is it important that he is of the seed of his father and he is deity and he is God? He has to be 100% God, not part God, 100% God, because he has to be perfect and sinless. He can't be part God and part human because human carries sin but God is perfect. He has to be a perfect sacrifice to pay for our sins. He's got to be 100% God, but he's also got to be 100% human. This is one of the mysteries, but it's to realize that, that he is both, and the way I view him determines what my belief in theology is. For instance, when Jesus does all the miracles in the Bible, he heals the sick, He heals the lame. He gives sight to the blind. Does Jesus do that as God? Or does he he perform that as man in perfect submission to the Father empowered by the Holy Spirit? 
Your answer to who Jesus is determines your theology and your belief today. There's some believe that when he did a miracle, he did it in deity as God, and therefore those miracles are no longer present today. We can't do those miracles because we're not God and deity. That those miracles were done to prove he was God, and so that is one theology, but if that's the case, then there's little hope for the power and the miracle of God functioning in our lives today. If you believe that all those miracles were done under the realm of being man, submitted to the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit, now my life takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Now I believe in the power of prayer. Now I believe that God can do miraculous things to those who are submitted and seeking not my will, but your will be done. Now I face life with a different lens. If I see Jesus walking into the desert and facing the devil as deity and God, what hope do I have to face the devil who's just merely man? But if I believe that God, Jesus, laid that deity aside and was drawn by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, encounters the devil using the power and the authority of the Word of God as a man, doesn't that change the way I look at what I can do with the devil in my life? See, what we believe defines who we are, doesn't it? He is the begotten Son of God. He is all human because he was born through Mary, the virgin birth. He is all God because his father isn't Joseph. Joseph is the stepfather. His father is the heavenly father. This is played out in Scripture on how he's both God and both human and why it's important that he he is both. First off, in John 3, 16, it declares this creed, and it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That means he is seed of the Father, not created by the Father. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory is of only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Philippians 2, 7, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in what? Human likeness. You know what's interesting, if you look at scripture, and you look at the gospels, in the gospel of Matthew, It tells the lineage of Jesus, and this is important because throughout the Old Testament, Jesus validates himself through prophecy. Prophets hundreds and hundreds of years before he was born prophesied who the Messiah would be. And for hundreds of years before Jesus was born, prophets declared that the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. There's 12 tribes, and the Messiah had to come through one particular tribe. If he came through the other, so he had to be Jewish and come through the Jewish lineage. If he wasn't Jewish, he wasn't the Messiah. But if he was Jewish, he had to come through the one tribe of Judah. If he was from the other 11, he couldn't be validated as the Messiah. Then to complicate it even crazier, not only was the Messiah predicted to come through Jewish lineage through the one of the 12 tribes, but he was to come through the line of David within that tribe. Amazing, right? So to validate who Jesus is before the Jews, Matthew goes through the lineage, starting with Joseph, his father, and goes all the way back through, showing that not only does Jesus the Messiah, born as the son, the stepson of Joseph, but comes Joseph comes through David. And to the Jews, the father is the legal heir, so the lineage has to go through him. However, Joseph was only a stepdad, wasn't he? So if you go to Luke, Luke shows a lineage and it doesn't match the one in Matthew. And someone go, wait a minute, what's the difference? Well, Luke shows the lineage through Mary, his biological mother. So you have the lineage 
of the father who's a stepfather declaring that, that the father, the heavenly father, is Jesus is dead, but then biologically to the Gentiles, it traces it through Mary. Through Mary, that same lineage goes through Joseph. Both the parents, the stepdad and the mom, fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus the Messiah being born out of the tribe of Judah through the lineage of David. He is fully God. He is fully human, in other words is what the two lineages prove. He is the begotten son. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's his second title. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Colossians 2.9. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. I believe that he is the Messiah, that he is Christo, that he is the one that saves. Hebrews 9.22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. He is my Savior. He is Christ, I believe. I believe that Jesus is Lord. It is a declaration that he is deity and God. He is the begotten Son. It is the declaration that he is my savior, he is Christo, he is Christ, the Messiah. I believe that Jesus is Lord. You know, there's this question of who is Jesus is, has been a question that has been asked since he walked. He goes to his disciples, what are people saying who I am? Some saying you're a prophet, some saying you're Elijah. And he looks at Simon, he goes, who do you say I am? He goes, you are the Christ. And he said, blessed are you. I remember growing up, when I was little, I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, all those years, I always believed in God. I always believed there was a God. I'd go to church once a year, maybe twice a year, but I, I just always believed God was out there. He was dealing with bigger issues than me. It wasn't a personal relationship, but I believed in God. In other words, I believed in the begotten Son. I believed Jesus existed. It didn't get me where I wanted to go in life. And then when I was 19, January 29th, 1984, he went from being the begotten son to being Jesus, my Christ, my Savior. And I remember on that Sunday evening, I walked down and I asked Jesus into my heart. I got baptized. I was saved. I was on my way to heaven. But I was miserable for the next three years. I had enough of Jesus in my life to just make me miserable. <laughs> I saw Jesus as my fire insurance, as my dad would say. Good old fire insurance, rescued me from hell. But I struggled because I needed to see Jesus as my Lord. I believed him as the begotten son. I believed he was Christ, but I had not come to a place in my life where I was willing to declare, I believe Jesus is Lord. And many times, Jesus would present himself and ask that question, am I Lord of your life? There was a man he encountered that said, what must I do to be right? And he said, observe the laws. And the man said, I've done all these things, but what am I still lacking? There's something I'm missing. There's something more that I want. And Jesus says this, he goes, he knew there was an area of his life that he had not surrendered to God. There was an area in this man's life, it was his wealth that was his God. And so Jesus says, go sell everything you have, making me, making him Lord and follow me. And it said, the man walked away sad because he had great wealth, meaning this, he could embrace the Messiah, but he couldn't embrace Lordship. It wasn't until 19, April 26. I, I like dates, don't ask me why. April 26, 1986, 
man, I had an encounter with God and the Holy Spirit that changed my life. And in that moment, I realized I needed to make him not my Savior, but I needed to make him my Lord. Man, every day, that was 35, 36 years ago. Every day I wake up, and I know, I know that I know it. I don't have to question it. I know he's the begotten son every day. I know he's the begotten son every day. I know that he is Christo. He is my Messiah. But I'm telling you, every single day, I'm challenged on that day on whether I will make him, I believe, he is Lord. And if you've heard my story, man, I did not want to go to Africa. <laughs> Don't send me to Africa. What was that? That was a testing if he was going to be Lord. I remember finally just surrendering. He says, you are Lord. I'll go to Africa. And he's like, I don't want you to go to Africa, but I want you to see me as your Lord. I remember when we started tithing, it was so hard to give him that first 10%. I had to decide, was he going to be my Messiah or was he going to be Lord and my provider and put him first? I remember there's been times where I've held on to bitterness, betrayal. And I wanted to be Lord of that wound. I wanted to hold on to it. But I had to decide that day if I was going to pick up the cross and follow him and let him be Lord of that hurt. Let him be Lord of that wound and that betrayal. See, every day, you've got to decide, who is Jesus? Because it's not enough that you believe in God. It's not enough that he's even your Savior. But in Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. It's not that if you confess with your mouth that he is God. It's not if you confess that he is Savior, but if you confess he is Lord, which means I'm all in, I'm all surrendered, I'm all yours, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. So today I'm going to just finish with this question, and it's the same one he asked, Peter, that now I'm asking you personally, who is Jesus? Hey, thank you for watching Victory Life Church on YouTube. I want you to subscribe so that you know when we go live or when we post new content. And also, leave me a comment and let me know how today's message spoke to you or where you're watching from or even how we can be praying for you. And if you would like to financially support the ministry, just click the link below. God bless you and thank you for joining us today.